So good morning, good evening, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for day five. Today we are going to be talking by your safety with Brent and then we're going to be talking to Glenn about housing. So Brent, if you wanna take it over. Absolutely, so I want to thank uh, Crystal and the international office for inviting me to have a conversation with you guys about fire safety because it's very, very important. Um, I do talk pretty quickly because there's a lot of information to provide you within a short period of time. So if uh, if I'm not clear on something, by all means, you can email me. You'll see my email address beside my name um, or add it to the chat, and I'll take a look at that when we're done. So I want to congratulate you on choosing the best college in Canada. I absolutely love Banshaw, and I trust that you're going to have an amazing experience because I think it's a pretty terrific place to not only work, but to study as well. So look forward to seeing you guys in person. So what I've come to talk to you about today is um, see what happened to my screen there because it just disappeared is to talk about it just disappeared exactly on the spot here as I pulled that out. I'm going to do a screen share. This looks awkward here, but it absolutely just disappeared on me when I pulled it up. So let me just reload it here. Sorry. You can entertain them with a sing song while I'm doing this, Glenn. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. <laughs> if I start singing, everybody will turn off their uh, Zoom. That, that's fair. There we go. Sorry about that. Had to reload it for some reason. It wouldn't uh, work for me. So we're going to talk about fire and life safety. <clears throat> Everything that I'm talking about is on the fan shop portal. You might not be aware of the portal yet. Trust me, the first day at the college will be quite well versed with the portal. Um, so this is our new SharePoint site, and this is where all of our information is housed. So I work in the emergency management office, and we do things on campus to keep you guys safe from a fire alarm safety system to response, emergency plans, emergency guidelines, that's all under our division. Our division is under Environment, Health, Safety, and Emergency Services. So if you look on the portal, it's under CHSMS, Standard 12 Emergency Preparedness and Response. And this exact presentation is under the quick links on the right-hand side under Fire and Life Safety Services. So you need to know that fire evolves relatively quickly. And the reason I asked uh, Crystal to sit in on these sessions is I appreciate that there's um, fire alarm systems in Canada at the college, but that's not necessarily a universal thing. I know in China, as an example, there's some provinces that don't have fire alarm systems. In India, there isn't fire alarm systems. So it's really important that you guys understand what you need to know to keep you safe, not only on campus, but off campus. And if it's off campus, Glenn Matthews certainly can help you with these type of things. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So I want you to understand that fire evolves really, really quickly. This is not a political statement about Christmas. So I'm not trying to be offensive to anyone who celebrates Christmas. It's more so just what the National Fire Protection Association um, puts together to show you and demonstrate how quickly fire can actually consume a room and evolve. So this is a Christmas tree. It is not watered at all, so it's dry. And what you're gonna see in here is a bit of a spark. It's gonna simulate an electrical fire. I want you to keep an eye on the countdown clock down here to show you how quickly fire can consume an area. Can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see that, Glenn? So I'll just stop it there for the sake of time. So what fire does is it finds a way to escape similar to what a mouse is, right? So it, it, the smoke, the flame, um, it will try and escape. It's not really the flame um, that will hurt you, it's the smoke. And that's what you have to be very careful of because that's what's most dangerous. But if you take a look on this clock, 18 seconds, and it's fully engulfed this room. This room is what's called a controlled burn. So it's a cell that they've set up to do this which allows it to actually come out the front so you can record it. In an actual condition, you'll have rooms that have doors and windows and everything that's in a closed position that doesn't allow that smoke to escape. So you all understand that when that smoke happens in the room, it's going to come as a plume and it's going to start coming down lower and lower and lower, which makes it really, really dangerous. So if you have working smoke detectors in your house, 15 seconds to 20 seconds, you'll be able to safely escape. 
anything past that is probably going to be problematic. So when you're living off campus, if you choose to live off campus, make sure that you have working smoke detectors in your house. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we have two different types of governing bodies in Canada. We have what's called the Ontario Building Code, and that is how to build something. So when that, that structure was built and what the provisions are in place, um, when that, that space was built. If something is renovated, they have to do what's called a retrofit, which means to bring it up to the current building code, okay? So building code is how it was built. Fire code is how that space is used, maintained, inspected, and all the systems in, in, in uh, that facility. So you can actually be charged under the Ontario Fire Code. If something happens and you've propped a door open as an example and somebody gets hurt, you can actually be charged. You can also be charged if you, and charge means the police arrest you and the police bring you to jail. That's what charge means. Um, you can be charged if you cause a false fire alarm. So purposefully pull a pole station when there is no fire condition that exists. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that as an education piece to know that bad things could potentially happen. So make those choices to make sure that you're safe. If you're acting in good faith, then you're fine, right? Meaning if you see smoke, flame, um, anything kind of that you de deem to be dangerous, then you can pull the pull station, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you, as an example, walk out in the hall and you see a red box on the wall that says fire and you're not really sure what it does, so you just pull it to see what happens, that's going to be a problem for you. OK, so don't do things unless you actually need those need that help. So you will see a house set up as an example. And I know I'm kind of leaning on Glenn's area here, but house off campus, as an example, um, we'll have working smoke detectors. So the fire code says you have to work, have a working smoke detector outside your bedroom. So in the hallway um, and on a flight of stairs. So if you go from bottom level to top level. You have to have a working smoke detector between the two levels so it'll activate to tell you there's a working fire condition in your house make sure if you see a smoke detector hanging up that the battery is not pulled from it that it's not knocked off make sure that it, it works you can actually test it if you live in an apartment building um, i wouldn't recommend testing it unless the landlord knows that you test it because it might be interconnected to their fire alarm system and you don't want to cause it an unwanted alarm so the buildings are actually set up by building code to protect you the walls have two hour separation, which means if I were to stand with a blowtorch against the wall, nothing will happen to it for two hours. The windows, smoke detectors, doors are your best friend. Always leave a door closed. That prevents the smoke and the flame from coming in, uh, but it also compartmentalizes the fire. So if you look at here as an example, this door is closed. When this fire is burning, all the smoke and all the flame will stay in this room because that door is making sure that it doesn't escape out into this area, okay? So make sure that you compartmentalize and close and keep those doors closed. So what do you do if you discover a fire? The acronym we use is REACT. We want to remove persons from the affected area. We never yell fire. Um, and the reason being is if you're in a woodworking shop, as an example, we don't want an accidental injury to occur because you've startled somebody. We want to ensure all those windows and doors are closed. Activate the nearest fire pole station, which I'll show you a slide in a second what that is. And in Canada, our emergency number is 911. So what I want you to do after today is put in your phone emergency 911. If you're on campus, the campus emergency number is this number here, the 519-452-4242. This gets you help. I want you to know that when you call 911, or if you're on campus and you call our emergency number, there's no charge associated to that. I appreciate depending on what your country is, sometimes you get a bill for that. We do not charge for that in Canada. So anytime you need help, uh, you know, for an emergency situation, so either medical, you've hurt yourself, or there's a fire, or somebody's endangering you, these are the numbers to call, and it's absolutely free of charge. And then the last point is to try to extinguish that fire if safe to do so. We don't ask that you actually extinguish the fire unless you've had that training. Um, if you have, by all means, you can, but not a requirement. And then when that's done, if you're on campus in class, you're going to report to the evacuation assembly area. Um, and there is a map in each of the classrooms and, and common areas that tells you where that is and how to get to it. And it's a centralized spot outside where you gather um, for safety reasons. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about fire alarm. So it's a red box on the wall. It says fire alarm, different variations. So it'll have here where it says pull down or lift and pull or this type of style or that type of style all does the same thing. 
So what this does is it gets you help. It tells everyone in the building that there's danger and you would only pull this if there's flame, smoke, or danger. So if there is a working fire in any way, shape, or form, then you pull this pull station. These, these do not operate doors. They do not um, lower basketball nets, which we've seen people in the past do. All it does is it gets you the emergency responders inside the college to come and help you, and it gets you the fire department to attend. So it's getting resources and it's telling everyone to get out of the building. You saw how quickly that fire alarm happened, uh, not fire alarm, pardon me, how that happened the, with the Christmas tree. So you don't have a lot of time and you have to um, actually move immediately and go outside immediately. So it summons internal responders, lights a do not enter sign, shuts down the HVAC system. So the heating, ventilation and air conditioning, mobility impaired begin to evacuate and the elevators will go down to the ground level. So the alert stage at the college, we have a two-stage fire alarm system at 1001 Fanshawe College Boulevard, as well as LDB. If you're at LDA or you're at South Campus, it's one stage, so alarm get out, but we have a two-stage alarm at the locations I described, and it first comes up as an alert, which is what it sounds like here. So this will repeat itself. Um, the actual messaging has changed. I have to update the slide deck so it doesn't say ladies and gentlemen anymore to be more inclusive, but it's a variation of that, okay? So when you hear Fred, that- I don't yeah. believe we could hear anything. Oh. We can now, but for a minute you went out. That's odd. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it again. One second, I don't know what's going on here. Tell me, thumbs up, Lynn, because I see on my screen if you can hear it now. I can't can hear, hear a, I can hear you, I can't hear a siren. That's odd, all right, give me one second here. All right, once more. We are investigating the cause. Please remain calm and stand by near the speakers for further instructions. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. An alarm has been activated. We are investigating the cause. Please remain calm and stand by near the speakers for further instructions. So if you're mobility impaired, you start evacuating during that stage, during the alert stage. So once you hear that, if you're in a wheelchair or on crutches or anything that's gonna prevent you from safely evacuating in an efficient way, um, then of course, that's when you start evacuating. If you are mobility impaired or have a medical condition, once you're at the college, you can go to Counseling Accessibility Services and request a personal emergency plan. And I will actually meet with you and we'll go over the responses um, relative to what your needs are to best support you. First stage alert, stand by the speaker. So you're gonna gather anything that's within your arm's reach. That's your personal property, okay? So your jacket, your keys, your purse, merce, whatever. If it's within arm's reach, grab it. I do not want you going to your lockers to retrieve something. I do not want you going to a classroom to retrieve something. I want you to be available to evacuate efficiently, okay? So if it goes to the second stage, which means get out of the building, if it happens to be cold outside and you go outside without a jacket on, we will put you in another building that's heated. So don't worry about the temperatures. Um, everything you've heard about Canada being cold is exactly true. So if it's too, too cold, we'll just put you into a safe spot, okay? So once it goes from alert stage, it could go to the second stage, which is evacuation, and this is what it sounds like. Attention, attention. There has been an emergency reported in the building. Proceed immediately in an orderly manner to the nearest exit and leave the building. So that will repeat itself and it's telling me to leave, okay? So we do not at any point in time use an elevator during a fire alarm, so do not use that. Once you leave the building, go to an evacuation assembly area. Uh, mobility impaired can go into a different building. If uh, you can't safely escape, then you go to the stairwell unable to evacuate or to a classroom or door with the door closed each door that leads into the corridor has what's called a fire rating of 45 minutes so that means if you stand with a blowtorch against that door nothing will happen to it for 45 minutes it's protected from both flame and smoke and then we never remove anyone from a wheelchair okay so things to do when you're evacuating 
These are the campus maps that I told you about. It's in all the classrooms. So it tells you what to do, okay? It tells you your escape routes, tells you where your nearest door is and how to get out of the building. Once you're outside the building, you're gonna look for this sign. It's called an evacuation assembly area and it's located in the parking lots. So once you get outside, you'll kind of see a herd of people going towards the spot. And this is where we want you to gather and you stay there until an emergency responder from the college or a firefighter from the city or somebody tells you that it's safe to go back in. So downtown campus has a single stage. So it's a bell or a tone. Um, and once you hear that, it just means leave, okay? So off campus 911, which we talked about, make sure you put that in your phone so you have that emergency number if there's a fire condition. Um, I won't get into that. Um, so what you guys need to know is there are good people in the world and bad people in the world. And I think you're well aware of that. So sometimes when you rent a house, and Glenn will talk more about this, they will try and get more money from you by overcrowding the house. That's not normal in Canada. Um, and it's very, very dangerous when you start putting multiple, 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 multiple people in a house. Um, I don't want to kind of step on Glenn's toes because he'll talk about it, but know that, you know, 15 people in the house is not normal. Okay. And make sure if you have a bedroom that it's not in a laundry room or anywhere where there's gas, make sure it's set up and safe and has working smoke alarms. You want to see ideally one person per bedroom. Some bedrooms will have more than one person, uh, but ideally one person. Make sure you have those working smoke alarms, as I talked about. Make sure that um, you're not sleeping beside a, a furnace, as an example, uh, because that is not normal. And you can either reach out to Glenn or myself if you have any question. Um, make sure you have a way to escape, either through a window or through stairways. Make sure that it's not cluttered and clear so you're able to safely leave. Um, and if you're in the basement, make sure your window is big enough for you to be able to escape. You can off campus direct any questions to the London Fire Department. You can Google how to do that. Um, or of course, Glenn Matthews is an expert with that. I'm glad to say that I work with Glenn. I worked with him for a number of years and he's absolutely fantastic. So by all means, if there's any questions, you can reach out to either of those folks um, or feel free to reach out to me. The college and some residents have what's called a sprinkler system. Make sure you're not hanging anything from the sprinkler system like this, okay? Because it makes the sprinkler system not function the way that's intended. Make sure you're not storing anything too close to that sprinkler head. So this will spray water out once it gets activated by flame. Um, it just shows different variations of sprinklers. Make sure that all your exits are clear so you can safely get out. So exit here tells you which door to leave during a fire alarm. Make sure you're not putting anything in front of it. What happens in a fire condition is more often than not, the lights will go out. So all of this will be dark. And what you don't wanna do is try and crawl on your hands and knees. So you stay below the smoke and try and navigate your way out while you're blocking your own exit, right? So make sure that that's free and clear of everything. Make sure that you're storing stuff properly and that you're using it properly. So all this stuff on the shelf here is flammable, which means it's really easy to burn. Um, they're oxidizers, so it allows the fire to burn, but even something as simple as dust on the floor. So dust can catch on fire, believe it or not, if there's an ignition, ignition source. So make sure that you have good housekeeping and that you're keeping things clear. Make sure you're not blocking panels, right? So anything that's there to protect you, such as this, make sure you leave it free and clear. So if you have a bedroom that has a panel in it for some reason, make sure that you can safely or somebody can safely open the door to that panel and disconnect the power if they need to. Um, different variations as well, uh, fire exits. So any door that has an exit sign is a fire exit leading to outside. So we're making sure that we're not putting anything in front of that door. We have exit lights here. So this tells you how to safely escape. So if you see a sign like this, where it looks like a person walking, um, it'll have an arrow saying it's that way to the exit or that way to the exit. If there's no arrow, it means the exit is straight ahead of you, okay? So it'll be like this as an example, or it will be like that. Um, these two signs have to always be illuminated 24 hours a day. So if you're in a building where it's not, make sure your landlord or talk to your landlord and ask them to light those up and they'll just replace the bulb. Or they have what's called photoluminescent signs here, which it means it's not electrically charged, it's glow in the dark. Um, so it should have a light source in front of it or near it um, to allow it to actually charge that sign and illuminate it. We never wedge or prop open a door. We showed you that example with the Christmas tree. Uh, that is a fire code offense. So it's something that you actually can get in trouble for. People can sue you, believe it or not. 
um, if they get hurt or if they start coughing because you chose to do something like that. So we never, ever wedge or prop open a door. Uh, different variations of propping doors. So it might be a wood wedge at the bottom, could be down the spine of the door on the inside or up at the cylinder. It might be something like this where somebody's used a fire extinguisher to hold open a door. Could also be accidental. So something like this as an example, somebody purposefully didn't put the mat there. And I can tell you from experience because I see it quite, uh, quite often. Um, that could be from somebody actually walking and accidentally kicking it. So as you're kind of shuffling your feet and you're not lifting it properly, um, it might actually move the mat like this to the point where it's actually impeding the exit. Fire doors have a fire rating on it. So it's contained fire with the fire door. So we always leave it closed. If it's in the corridor, it's a 45 minute rating, which buys you a lot of time. So this shows you the value of actually not wedging open a door. You can see on the right hand side where this door was actually properly closed during a fire condition and the door on the left hand side where the door was left open. So this person obviously has all their family pictures and everything here that uh, they will keep forever. And unfortunately, this person has lost everything. This was not a staged picture. So, you know, this was an actual fire that occurred and they took the picture of the fire scene. So it just reinforces why we keep a door closed unless we're walking through it evidently, and then it closes behind us. So pole stations are those red boxes on the walls. They're found at all exits. Um, make sure that it's not obstructed. Make sure you're storing those chemicals properly. You saw that in a picture. Uh, smoke alarms. So this, as an example, means the smoke alarm was taken off. It should have one of these at the bottom of here. So there's no working smoke alarm there. Um, and then this one obviously is not gonna function if it's not mounted properly. So different variations are electrical or battery operated. Um, and if you have a smoke alarm on uh, that you are maintaining or bought for yourself and it's battery, make sure that every year on your birthday, you change the battery, um, just as a reminder. Do not overload circuits in any way, shape or form. So these electrical cords actually have a resistance rating. So we're never daisy chaining power bars. We're never using extension cords unless it's something temporary. We're not overloading circuits. We're not running extension cords through any door jams because it can cause an electrical fire um, if it's a pinch point. And an example of a power bar, somebody will use a power bar thing that's safe because it actually has a system reset on it, but they actually fail. And that's the exact scenario here where it's overloaded, got too hot, melted and caught fire. So don't use a power bar unless you're putting a computer on it or something kind of where it's a low voltage. Anything high voltage, like a microwave or a kettle or a toaster oven has to be plugged directly into the wall. So do not plug that into a power bar. And the last thing is sometimes things in the world are cheap and they're cheap for a reason. And I really like a good deal myself. But if you look at this as an example, this is a cell phone adapter that was bought at one of our local dollar stores. Um, and it's an iPhone charger. So a student bought that because it was only three or $4 and that kind of works out with a student budget and then they plug their iPhone in it. Well, this at three or $4 has really cheap components on the inside for the most part, right? So what happened is this, when it was plugged in, got overheated and it melted and it was borderline to the point of catching fire and we got it just in time. But the importance of this is not only will it cause a fire, but it actually will ruin your cell phone as well. It actually changes the electronics in it um, and it can damage your phone. So don't buy something cheap from a dollar store, buy something quality if it's something that you definitely wanna keep for a long, long time. So everything that we talked about uh, is under the emergency management site, including my email address at the bottom. I think I went over by quite a few minutes and I apologize on that, but there's a lot of information to disseminate. Um, if there's no questions, then I will thank you and congratulate you once again on choosing the best college in Canada and look forward to seeing you in person. So are there any questions just for a minute or two before I log off? Awesome, so thank you very much. Um, I apologize, Crystal, for going over, but we know I love the sound of my own voice, but it's very, very important that we learn fire, so. This is really important stuff, right? Like this is life-saving stuff, and especially coming from countries where a lot of a lot of this stuff isn't known. So no, no, thank you for joining us. Um, and that's okay if this goes over a bit. That's okay too. No thank problem. And so I've much. been on this job for over thirty years, and our student fires every year, every year. So it's not a good thing. No, and it happens really quickly, right? Nobody intends to actually have something catch on fire. Um, but usually it's not only their choice, it's their roommates or somebody else's, right? So.
Oh, I have a bunch of questions coming through on the chat. So it's, yeah, you should always have a working smoke detector outside your bedroom, so in the hallway, and then in between levels of the house. So that's the minimal requirement. If you want to have three or four smoke detectors, the more the better, right? Um, the other thing you have to have, and I think Glenn talks about this, is a carbon monoxide detector outside where you sleep. So it has to be plugged into the wall as well, and that's by fire code. So if you have a gas leak in your furnace, as an example, um, that carbon monoxide detector will wake you up and tell you that there's a problem. So you would then leave the house or wherever you are and call the fire department because there's a lot of things that can go really, really bad quickly um, with that. So why must you close the door? It's to contain the smoke. So if that door is open and the smoke leaves, it's not going to allow the smoke detector to work. So when that door is in the closed position, it's going to force the smoke to go up and activate the detection that's in the room that you're in. It's going to protect you. Uh, so I'm seeing actually a lot of good questions coming up. So the last one I'll answer. And then if you have any questions past here, just email me, okay? Because um, I appreciate that uh, there's others I wish to speak. So um, email me the questions. So uh, quality products. So it's just anywhere that like Walmart, as an example, which is a store in Canada, um, any place that has what's called a ULC or a CA, CSA listing on it um, means that it's been approved. Okay, so if you're buying something at a cheap, cheap store is the easiest way to say this, then you're going to assume that you're buying a cheap, cheap product. So if you are spending a little bit more money and it's something good quality, um, then by all means, well, there's a lot of questions coming up. Um, if it's something good quality, then you can just assume that it's going to be a good quality product. Okay. So I'm going to end it there just for the sake of time once again, and I apologize. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can either ask Crystal, because I know she's very, very knowledgeable on a lot of stuff with this. Um, as is Glenn Matthews, or if you can't get the answer, by all means, email me. Uh, Crystal can help you because I think there's a, a question in the chat about first aid courses and a whole bunch of kind of things that we're not talking about right now. Um, but there's a lot of things that the college can provide you with and a lot of opportunities um, that you can only better yourself with. So other than that, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Brent. See you tomorrow, Glenn. Yep. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Brent and now just quickly answer a couple of those questions. Yes, on 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 campus, you will find the defibrillators like everywhere on campus. Like so, if something were to happen, you do have access to those. Uh, they also offer first aid courses through our continuing education uh, programming, so that's an option as well. So just because I'd seen those questions come in. So Glenn, if you are ready, I'm going to try to share my screen and cover your PowerPoint. All right, and we will go through relatively quickly, but um, this presentation will be available, uh, right, Crystal? Usually it is available through the office. And I will give my contact information. Yeah. I can resave it and then um, try to try to share it. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. And it's good that you're here because you're way ahead of the game as far as learning out what you need to know to learn uh, about finding housing. Obviously there's the on-campus residents that you might want to think about. Um, a large number of students do live off campus. And what we do is we recommend a five-step process um, to, to go through about doing this. Um, next slide, Crystal. Uh, the first is cost, trying to figure out what you want to do. Money-wise, you want to think about how many roommates you have. Uh, you want to think about a type of accommodation, whether you want to be in a house or an apartment building. We want to think about different leases, uh, whether they're legal or not, and you want to think about what your lifestyle is to uh, to be able to move forward. So under cost, this is a biggie because people always want to know how much it uh, costs to live in London. Um, we're since the pandemic, the prices have gone up significantly. So you're probably looking at anywhere from seven hundred and fifty to a thousand dollars in a shared accommodation per bedroom. 
that's pretty steep, I understand, uh, but it, it's partly what the market is. If you want to be in an apartment or a bachelor uh, loft apartment, you're paying thirteen to seventeen hundred for one bedroom. You got to think about what that includes and are your utilities included or not. Sometimes a landlord will include them. Uh, sometimes they won't. You know that you know electricity, water, internet, uh, things like that. You got to get included or 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 at least find out whether you're going to have to pay for them or not. You want to think about how can I reduce my costs? Uh, maybe the landlord, uh, uh, or maybe they'll let you have extra roommates, or maybe you got a part-time job. You want to think about um, uh, payments up front. So how many extra costs will I have? Landlords, if you're covered by the Ontario law, and I'll get into that in a minute, the most they can ask for is last month's rent as a deposit. Um, typically, industry standard is uh, uh, first and last, but technically they can only ask for last month's rent. However, with international students, guarantors are often, landlords will often ask all tenants for a guarantor. And while the landlord is not allowed to ask for more than one month's rent as a deposit, they can ask for a guarantor. And if you can't provide a guarantor, the landlord's not allowed to ask for extra money, but you can, as a tenant, offer more money as a deposit to cover rent. Um, I'd be cautious about doing that unless you're absolutely sure the place is there. Um, we talk about the cost of um, insurance because, as I mentioned at the end of Brent's uh, presentation, we've had two different international students cause fire damage. One was for $50,000 and one was for $60,000 and they did not have insurance. That's a pretty heavy burden to try and pay off down the road. So think about insurance. Um, you might want to go through and do a sample budget. We have one on our website that I'll give you at the end. Just a, an idea of how much am I going to, uh, to spend throughout the year. Um, the second step is roommates and how many people can I think I can live with? How well do I know them? Do I know their living habits? Can we work well together? Am I a night person or a day person? Are they a night person or a day person? Um, can I do a roommate agreement, which is also on our website, because that eliminates some of the disputes that people might have about cleanliness or a uh, cleaning schedule with regards to the bathroom, et cetera. And, and a big one with roommates is, can I talk to them about money? Are we going to share money to pay for common costs like uh, cleaning supplies? Or are we going to share meals at all? Um, like I said, the tenant agreement is, is, or the roommate agreement is the best way to avoid some of this. Um, has been less of an issue lately, but Still an issue is COVID um, and living together with other people and communal living. Um, some people are okay with it, some aren't. Some people don't want visitors because that increases the possibility of COVID uh, being spread. So you need to think about having a rule about visitors and guests and you should have that anyway. So you avoid uh, problems around exams or assignments and stuff. Third step, accommodations. Do I want to be in a room, in a house, or a house, the whole house? Do I want to be in an apartment? Um, you, you know, you want to think about how I go about looking for a place. So Fanshawe has a website which has private landlords that list with the college uh, that want to rent to students. Uh, website will pop up just the next uh, point. Yeah, there. So. Um, if you can't find something there, what I typically suggest is you get a bus pass with your tuition, um, do a Google search for apartments along uh, bus routes and maybe just contact those buildings directly and see whether or not they'd be willing to consider you. Be very, very careful of websites that are buy and sell. I've had one year I asked every student that came to me with a problem where they found their housing. So it was over 350 different students that came to me with a problem. 
every one of them, 100% of them found them on, they found their housing on the most popular buy and sell website. So you want to be very careful with regards to that. Um, like I said, you want to think about bus routes and what place, what typically, what kind of place do I, you know, some people want to be in a house because they want to be able to sit in their backyard. Although in the wintertime, that may not be the best spot. Um, some people want to be in an apartment because it's easier. You don't have to take the or drag the garbage to the curb. Just walk down the hallway and throw it down the, the garbage chute, which makes it a little easier. Uh, less upkeep in an apartment than in a house off campus. The one thing we do suggest is have patience. People jump the gun and go really quickly on these. So have some patience. Take a checklist with you that's on our website when you're considering looking at a place so that, that you've got an idea and compare. Don't, many students do this, do not take the first place you see. You wouldn't buy the first piece of electronic items that you found. You do some comparison shopping and try and find out what's, uh, what's a better deal, et cetera. Uh, next slide, Crystal. Um, does the place have everything, have everything I need? Does it have a dishwasher? Dishwasher solves a lot of problems. Does it have laundry or do I have to go five blocks to get my laundry done? Uh, what's the condition of the place? That's a good indication probably of whether it's a good landlord or not. Like if things need fixing, uh, maybe be better to avoid it. Uh, Brent went into fire safety uh, pretty uh, safely. So like I said, we have fires every year. So you want to be careful about that. Um, are buses nearby? Is it safe? Uh, the smoke and CO2 detectors there. And I know it's difficult when you're an international student, but we strongly suggest do not take a place sight unseen. Virtual tours is one way to do it, but even virtual tours can be faked. All right. We strongly recommend do a FaceTime with the landlord and see the landlord actually and see the outside of the building, see them the address on the building, see them using a key to enter the building and then walking you through the apartment. Live FaceTime is much better than a virtual tour. And if you still have some concerns, you can go on Google Maps and see whether or not uh, the place looks like the place that they showed you. Um, ask. Oh yeah, this would be a good way. The single best way to avoid a bad landlord. Ask the current, ask the landlord for information to talk to current or previous tenants. Students are happy, very happy to tell you their experiences. All right, so that, that they can tell you whether or not it's a good landlord or not. And be careful of taking the cheapest place. I know education's expensive, but most people run into difficulties when they take the cheapest place available. Um, this website that I put up here, the City of London requires all rentals that have four or less apartments or units to be licensed. So you can actually go on this website, enter an address, and see whether or not they're licensed. This is not for apart major apartment buildings. It's for four or less units uh, where most of the issues um, end up. Okay, step number four, leases. Um, strongly recommend getting a lease. Um, in Ontario, um, sorry, um, in Ontario, Ontario standard lease is required if you are covered by the Residential Tenancy Act, most landlords will not give you an eight-month lease. Almost since the pandemic, almost all landlords want a 12-month lease. And the Ontario Standard Lease is a government document that must be used when the Residential Tenancy Act applies. The Residential Tenancy Act is the Ontario rental law that governs relationships, and the Ontario Standard Lease must be used. If you do not uh, share with the owner or the owner's immediate family and you're not a tenant of a tenant, you're covered by the law. If you are a tenant of a tenant 
or you share with the owner or the owner's immediate family, you have no rights. You might as well know this right up front. You have absolutely no rights. Um, you want to think about whether or not the landlord is requiring a separate or joint lease. A separate lease is you're the only person on it. Joint lease is when there's multiple tenants on one lease. And we highly recommend do not sign a joint lease if you don't know who the other people are, because you will become liable for their rent and their damages if you are on a lease with them. So be very, very careful. Many landlords, not all, but many landlords ask for a guarantor. It's about 50%, but that number is growing. Um, I mentioned you could offer a larger deposit, which must be used for rent to avoid uh, the landlord requiring a guarantor. Some landlords, especially larger landlords, require an application, but be very careful about signing an application because some people think it's just an application. Most applications have a little clause in them that lock you into the lease. Um, so don't sign an application unless you absolutely sure you want the place. I once had a student sign five applications and all five landlords accepted them as a tenant. So they were literally bound by five leases. So be very careful. And if the landlord promises you anything in writing, garbage, uh, verbal is absolutely useless, get it in writing, even if it's not in the lease, get a confirmation email from the landlord. So if they're promising to change the logs, uh, paint the place, shampoo the carpets or anything like that nature, which they do not have to do, get it in writing. And unfortunately, many international students will pay by cash. Um, do not ever pay by cash unless you get an immediate receipt. Even if it's on toilet paper, get something in writing that you paid the rent for whatever address for whatever time period. Because you know we've had students pay and then two months, three months later, the landlord says, you didn't pay that and you have no proof that you paid it. So absolutely get a receipt. Okay, lease continued. Um, you know, you wanna be able to prove that you have a lease. So like I said, it's an ideal thing to keep any documentation, get it in writing. If it's under the Residential Tenancy Act, landlord must give you a copy within 21 days. If it's not under the RTA, um, just ask the landlord for something. And as I just mentioned, get receipts immediately because you've got to be able to prove uh, that that they were uh, uh, pay, that they were paid for what you're talking about. Number five, oh, uh, how do I know if a lease is okay? One thing I would say to you is we do lease reviews. So if you want to send it to me, I will get back to you and give you all the information that you need to know whether your lease is okay or not. Happy to do that. Uh, we're here in the summertime, so we can get back to you in the summertime as well. And please know that it is extremely difficult to get out of a lease, so don't sign unless you're absolutely sure. Number five, lifestyle. You know, you need to think about... Um, what you want and how comfortable you are with places. I've already mentioned apartments are a little easier to for chores and stuff like that. But if you have roommates, you wanna divvy up chores, dividing schedules, wanna think about smoking, wanna think about having friends or partner over. Like we, uh, we've had roommates complain that roommates have thrown parties the night before they had a major exam. So you wanna think about those kind of rules. Um, you need to be aware of city bylaws so you don't end up getting charged under something. City has a noise bylaw that's 24 seven. I've seen students get tickets at 10 a.m. Um, there is rules around garbage. There's rules about parking on the street. So you really need to know what those rules are. And I, I can go into that further if you have questions about it. Um, after the five steps, there's just some things you should be aware about. Uh, once you're in the place, strongly recommend the first thing you do when you move in, take pictures, date stamp pictures, because you want to be able to prove if there's anything wrong with the place um, so that when you leave, you can prove that the place was like that when you move in. 
All windows must have screens in the summertime. All bedrooms must have windows. We have students that are living in uh, rooms that don't have windows. And as through Brent's uh, presentation, you can see how dangerous that might be. And smoke and CO2 detectors are required outside bedroom areas. Uh, and sometimes a landlord will require tenants to put batteries in them. Uh-uh, landlord is required to have them working. So it's re landlord's requirement to have them working. Uh, landlords are required to provide heat uh, 20 degrees during the day, 18 at night between September 15th and June 15th. I'm going to tell you 18 at night is cold. Um, I would never have it 18, but if the landlord's hitting 18, that's all they're required to do. They're required to provide you with water, hot and cold. Um, they are required to provide you electricity, uh, at least the availability of. They may make you pay utilities, but they have to be able to provide you such that you can get it. Landlords responsible for bug and rodent removal. And the only way they can bill you is if they can show that you caused the problem, right? So we've had different students over the year put a year's worth of garbage in the garage. Well, that's going to bring in mice, rats, squirrels, whatever. Um, so if the landlord incurs a cost, they can pass that cost along to you. But just normal cleaning and stuff like that, if you end up with bugs, landlord is required uh, to remove them. Now, that's a pretty quick summary of, of what we recommend. Like I said, my email um, will come up in the next slide, but you really want to do some due diligence because you're going to be in the place eight to 12 months. The last thing you want to do is have a hard day at school and then come home and hate being at home, right? That's the last thing you want. So put a little effort in. I like to tell students, put as much effort into uh, looking for an accommodation as you would look for a phone because you wouldn't buy the first phone off the shelf. You do a little research, you do a little costing, you know, you kind of look into it to make sure uh, sure it meets all your needs and stuff like that. So we recommend um, you just spend a little time and get there. Um, you can see the listings as I note here and my email and phone number are here. Uh, if you're international, it's probably better to email me uh, with questions, stuff. The one question we get consistently is finding housing. We do not find housing for people. We redirect people to the website where private landlords list with us, or we talk about ways that you can find housing using bus routes as an example through Google Maps, et cetera. The one thing I do sometimes do without recommending housing, sometimes international students that have families, um, I'm gonna admit it's harder to find a place when you have a family, um, but I can redirect people that have families into certain areas that are typical of where student families go and look for a place that way. Um, that was pretty quick, um, and I'm sorry it was quick, but uh, just trying to, to make respect everybody's time. Um, happy to answer any questions that people might have. Just looking in the chat room right now. I think these more have to do with Brett's presentation. Glenn, there's a question there about how to get rental insurance. Okay. The, um, we're not allowed to recommend anybody, but what we strongly recommend is there are, if you just Google insurance companies in London, contact two or three or four of them and just get quotes. Um, they'll, they'll be happy to give you a quote. Like I said, it'll probably be four to $600 for a year. Um, but take the best quote. Can we get a family paying guest accommodation? Is that a culture there in London? We will get it. That means staying with the Canadian family as a paying guest. You, you're staying with a family? 
want to stay with some local family is that a facility available um they used to do well, i forget crystal what the program was but yeah we actually do still offer it through kick um through uh, the Canada Homestay Network. Yeah. So, so we do have a third-party company that looks after that kind of Canada-wide. Um, and so our students can, if they would like, go that route. I mean, it's a nice route if you know that you want to live with a family and sort of have a slow, um, like more of a family feel to your arrival and your stay in Canada. It's definitely a great option for students that uh, are looking for that sort of thing. I'm just blanking on the name of the program, but what it used to be called, but. Yeah, it's um, Homestay. Homestay, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. And some places call, now call it Culture, culture Works. Um, but, but there are programs like that around. Okay. I think Brent took all the questions out of my, out of people's minds. Couple questions there. Um, if you sign a lease for six months and a month in you are, you don't like where you are living, can you get out of it? It's very, very difficult. Um, there are only three ways out of a lease under the Residential Tenancy Act. One is a negotiated settlement with the landlord, which landlords are typically, first of all, they won't do a six month lease. Um, most landlords will not agree to let you out of the lease. You can do what's called an assignment. So you find somebody else to take your spot, uh, but it means a little bit of legwork to find somebody. And then you can also file with the landlord tenant board which is like landlord to tenant court, um, but you have to have a justifiable reason for doing that. Like it's an illegal rental or somebody, the landlord has done something so horribly wrong that you've got grounds to get out of it. But whatever you do, don't sign a lease thinking you want out later. This is why we strongly recommend do some research before you actually log, log, uh, lock into a lease. There is some residence questions here. So residence over the summertime is available for short-term stays or for the summer period. So there is that option, but only over the summertime. So if you're arriving for the May term, that kind of works out perfectly for that as an option. Um, and if you wanted more info on that, you could just send us an email to fanshawcares at fanshawc.ca and we would be able to send you out the application and the information. Um, if you've applied to residence for the summer, I know that the residence team is going to be processing applications in the next couple of weeks. So it's not that there's um, nothing happening. It's just a bit of a process with them to process the summer applications. Um, someone had asked if they want to make sure their rental agreement is okay. Can they send it to you to check yes. it? Yes, yes. Yeah, very much happy to take uh, information about, uh, about leases and give you feedback. Somebody asked about security deposit before shifting. I'm thinking shifting means moving in. Landlord can ask for a deposit the minute the lease is signed. And somebody <laughs> asked to find what a lease is. Like I said, send it to me, whatever you get, and I'll give you feedback on it. Somebody's Where's asking it? about sublets. Uh, sublets are okay. Um, generally okay but again you have to do the same thing you got to make sure it's not an internet scam because sometimes people will scam so you want to be able to do the facetime thing um there is a residence question there that i can answer there and it was just about cooking in residence so you can cook in residence and over the summertime they rent out the townhouse unit so you would actually have a full kitchen there if you were in residence during the year, there's just a specific floor designated for actual cooking if you're in the tra traditional buildings, but you can cook food. That is an option. Um, somebody's asking about uh, final destination. I think some internet or international need to know where they're, the government will wanna know where they're living. 
right? So you don't put down the airport's address or the college's address. You put down where you're going to be living. Oh, it looks like there's there's someone has raised their hand. Yeah, Tende, did you want to ask your question? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Okay, please. I want to ask about um, areas to stay in um, in London South when you have children. So, where are the you know safer place to stay when you have children? Are you at the South Campus? Yes, London South. Okay. Um, the South Campus is fairly new, so the rental market for students in that area has not developed uh, very well. But if you email me, I will send you where typically where families live in that area. Uh, like I said, I cannot recommend a particular property, but I can can tell you uh, typically where families will go. Okay, okay, thank you. And is it also possible to send you, because we are still trying to get an accommodation from here in Nigeria, is a little bit challenging. However, if we get um, an, a property and they give us like a contract, we can always send it to you before we sign to help us proofread? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think Amal Preet has his hand up, him, her, her hand, him, hand up. Hello. Hi. Good evening. Good, good morning. I want to question. My college is in Simco. Will I get a cafeteria nearby? Um. We are not, um, there, there's not much in the way of uh, Simcoe campus. It's a small town, so it's a little bit harder to find places. But I, like I, like I, I in, indicated before, what I would do is go to Google Maps and I would search out rental or apartment buildings in Simcoe. Should I maybe and, and then contact uh, their contact information directly? Should I mail you then? Sorry? Should I mail you then? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what you're asking. Should I mail you? Mail me. Like uh send an email. Should yeah, you, you can you can send me an email and I'll get back to you, but but it's going to be the same information. But yeah, you can email me. Thank you. Okay. And can everyone just make sure that we are staying muted if you're not asking the question? Well, Duwala, could you mute yourself? There's a lot of background noise. Yeah, you do. Hello, do 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 do. I hear you. So there is a question here, just asking, what are some of the better areas for students to live in? So, um. Again, there is um, a crime map on the London Police Services website. So if you email me about that, I can send you uh, the link to find it. But basically, London Police track everything in the way of crime in the city. And you can get a sense of where places are. The unfortunate thing is students are often a target. Right, so you may find a fair bit of crime in the student areas, particularly with break-ins, because smart thieves know when students aren't around and they know students have small electronics. So 
you need to be really diligent about locking your doors, closing your curtains when you're not home. Osita? Yeah, oh, hello. Hello. Good day. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, good day, please. Um, sorry for deviating with you. I asked the question before about the arrival address when I'm filling my details for the international student fund. Does it mean the airport I'm landing in or my final destination, like the accommodation? So I believe you're you're asking an arrivals question. If you are filling out your yes. ISF form and you don't know yet where you are going to stay, you can leave your accommodation address blank and we will book you a shuttle to Robert Q and you'll receive that notice. And then once you have an address, so you can send us an email at least four business days prior to your flight and we can change the drop-off address. Ma'am, ma'am, what if you, I... I have another one the contact information. So, yeah. If I don't have a, I don't have a Canadian number yet, can I use the contact information for my home? So I, I, I'm wondering if you can send specific questions to Fanshawe Cares at fanshawec.ca. I think we don't have a great connection. So there's a lot of um, static noises when you're speaking. So I'm not sure that I'm un understanding your question correctly. And I did just share the PowerPoint to the chat. So you should be able to see that. Ma'am, what if I not use the uh, shuttle service? Actually, I have booked it. But uh, the, if my time if my time not matched with it, will I have to pay afterwards to college? Uh, so you need to let us know prior to that you're not going to use the shuttle if we've booked it for you because we get that charge. If you if you are a no show, we still get the charge. So you do need to let us know. Ma'am, how much it will be charged afterwards? How many dollars? Well, the cost of the shuttle ranges between like uh, 120 and 150 dollars. So you okay. want to just make sure to let us know prior to, so that we can cancel it at least 24 hours. But I'm thinking, Crystal, he's asking if he pays if he uses it. But we we've all already booked him a shuttle. Okay. Yeah. So I recognize his name from yesterday. So he has a shuttle booked. And if you decide to not use it, then you need to let us know because we will get charged for the booking. Okay, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you. There was a question about what happens if you are in a lease and the landlord decides that him or his family are moving in. Can they end your lease? If the landlord is not currently in the place, they cannot break the lease during the term of the lease but they can give you 60 days notice at the last 60 days of the lease to, to take over the rental right they can't do it in the middle of the lease but they can do it at the end of the lease difference between a lease and a contract basically it's the same thing just different language uh, but generally it's it's seen as a lease is under the rent, the Residential Tenancy Act of Ontario, so Ontario rental law. Contracts are when you're not covered by the law and you're living with the owner or the owner's immediate family. And there's a question around the cost of utilities, and that's going to vary a lot depending on the type of housing they've chosen and how many people are sharing it. Can be typically we're seeing anywhere from fifty dollars a month Canadian uh, to one hundred and twenty-five dollars per month per Canadian, depending at, depending on how many roommates you have, depending on what services are included. You know, typically, you know, if if internet's included, that's nice, but what's the bandwidth? Because if the landlord gives you basic internet and there's five people in the house, you might be so frustrated how slow it is. So you, you want to make sure you know how good the internet is if it's included.
there was a question of how long should should they plan to stay in temporary accommodations while looking for a place? Like how long will it likely take them? Depends on when they come. The sooner they come, it'll be shorter. The longer, if it's longer or close to when they need to, it'll be longer. Because as you get closer to the as you get can you please mute yourselves? Thank as you. you get as you get closer, um, it, it, the things ramp up and places start to go, and you you less choices to find a place. So, um, typical typical is a week for people. Some people get away with two days. Uh, some people do an Airbnb for a month. Best areas for students to live? I don't know if there's a best area. I usually suggest close to a bus route. You might as well, you get a, you get a bus pass. Um, if you live a little farther away from the college, you're gonna pay less rent. The closer you live to college, you're gonna pay more rent. So I, I just usually recommend look at the bus routes, Try and find a place close to the bus routes. On campus, how much do you charge for accommodation? On campus accommodation. You'd for have to. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the on campus uh, residence is rented a bit differently over the summertime. So they rent it at about $6.50 a month with your utilities included. That's only over the summertime. During the school year, it is a contract for eight months. So from September to April, you would be locked into a contract. And that uh, does cost, I want to say, around 1100 to 1200 a month is what it works out to be for those eight months. So it really depends on what, what you're planning on. But the summertime is the one time when there's a little bit of wiggle room with that. And they may offer, um, also offer short-term stays. Now, residents typically would not accommodate families, but during the summertime, they do rent out um, some, some of the buildings as a hotel type stay, and then a family could use those ac accommodations. So there's options. Ma'am, can, ma can you please read my message in chat box, ma'am, from Shubham Grover? Yeah, I, I'm just seeing your message come into me, and I'm just in the middle of explaining something else, and then I will get to your question. If you'd like, please send us an email to fanshawcares at fanshawc.ca so we can respond to your very specific questions, okay? Um, but yeah, so there is the option over the summertime that a family could potentially stay for a short term in residence because um, it's rented out differently, but that's once again only over the summertime. I just think I just answered the resident's question. So there is the option for short term over the summer term, which is a term that, that you would be arriving in. For any residents' questions, please send us an email to fanshawcares at fanshawc.ca. Okay, so I think that about wraps up the specific questions for you, Glenn. Um, so I want to thank you again. Like this is so helpful for the students planning to come so that they can be aware of what the process might look like. And it really gives them some helpful tips to navigate what, what would be a huge uh, component of their transition to life in Canada. Well, and as I said, feel free to email me with questions. Like I said, we don't find housing, but we can certainly give you feedback on what to be aware of, what to look for, what's in a lease, things like that, don't sign a lease without having it checked. Because like I said, once you lock in, you're locked in. It's, it's not an easy thing to get out of. All right, I do have to run, Crystal, so thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, everybody. And don't forget to join us again on Monday. We will have more care here and the Fanjaw Student uh, Union. So we have a whole other uh, series next week. So ma'am, come back and join us. Yes, ma'am. If uh, ma'am, as you uh, said that you they will put into ATM shuttle service, but uh, I don't, ma'am. Where I will wait for that much time? I can use taxi also, now. So if you choose any other method than waiting for the shuttle, then you will will be responsible for the cost. But can you please send your questions to Fanshawe Cares at fanshawe.ca because oh. they're very specific to your situation.
Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend. Uh, for Thanks. some of you, the weekend's probably started. Uh, and then we'll hopefully see you back here Monday morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care.